The following is general advice only and should not be construed as accounting, legal, or any other professional advice. The details of your situation are fact-dependent and you are advised to seek the help of a competent professional. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Hey, welcome back to another action-packed edition of CP Review, the official podcast of another71.com. As always, I am your humble host, Jeff Elliott, a licensed CPA in the state of Kansas. By the grace of God, happy Thursday to you. Today is Thursday, March 24th, 2016. On today's show, we are going to cover some news from NASBA covering the 10-day testing window extension as well as transitional credit rules which deal with what happens if you pass a section of the CPA exam under the current format which is 2016 and then so you, you pass two parts in 2016 and then pass two parts in 2017 what happens because as of April 2017 the exam is changing so how does that affect you and we are going to get to your questions as well as some important CPA exam terminology that will hopefully help you on exam day. And we will do that for all four sections. So up first is NASBA's announcement. So I was on Facebook, which I'll plug my Facebook page, facebook.com slash another 71. I think there's about 43,000 of you who... Uh, like the page so thank you for that and if you haven't liked the page yet the main benefit to you is my um, CPA exam articles will pop up in your timeline hopefully and while you're up uh, while you're on Facebook um, perusing uh, information about people whom you haven't seen in 10 years and will likely never see you again and will probably not come to your funeral uh, <laughs> that's pretty bad. Uh, uh, hopefully, some of you will get a reminder in your timeline to uh, study. So, anyway, um, <laughs> so how how's that for an outlook on life? Um, should I be friends with you? Hmm. Will you go to? Will you come to my funeral? Probably not. Well, maybe we shouldn't have lunch. Okay. So, anyway, on the face on my Facebook page, someone said, "Hey Jeff, I'm able to, um, I'm able to schedule an exam for June, and I just, I didn't know, so I didn't, I didn't answer until I got an answer. Well, um, a frequent poster on the forum, Golf Ball, and he also is a ninja blogger, Raleigh. He emailed me and said, "Hey, have you seen this?" And so at nasbet.org, they have an update. And it's, it's an update to the testing window. So, and I'll just read it. In order to accommodate the anticipated demand for test center seats, the testing window will be extended through the 10th of the third month of each testing window. So what that means is the blackout window for each, for each quarter. So in, Q in Q2, that's June. So beginning with the second quarter of 2016, which is June 2016, September 2016, December 2016, and March 2017. During the anticipated launch window of the next version of the exam, which is April through June 2017. So they're launching the new 2017 exam in Q2 2017. The 10 day extension will be suspended and then they will reinstate it for the Q3 and Q4 2017 exams. So I'm glad NASBA did this, NASBA and the AICPA, although I will say that demand for testing center seats is nothing new. So I've been doing another 71 since 2008. So that's eight, eight years, yeah. And the demand has not changed. It's always been crazy. But I'm glad that they decided to do it. So change is good even if it's been a long time coming. 
So what that means is <laughs> so what that means is everyone's going to schedule their their exams for like the first week of June. <laughs> so hey, but at least it'll open up some seats for the uh, for the second week or the second month, the end of the second month of the quarter. Additionally, transitional credit rules, they say, due to the commonality of content and sections between the current and next version of the, of the exam, NASBA and the AICPA have determined that any combination of passing current exam sections and future exam sections will count towards completing the examination requirement for licensure. So what does that mean? That means the new exam is going to be similar to the to the current exam. It's just going to have some little tweaks. So it's not going to be crazy. <laughs> no matter what my little rap video says, if you haven't seen my little rap video, <laughs> well, you're probably not missing much, but uh, it is kind of funny. But although I have, see, I did, I did um, have someone write me that I am an embarrassment to the profession, <laughs> which is probably true. Uh, they go on to say, for example, if a candidate has conditional credit in BEC, they will retain credit for that section until its expiration date, which is 18 months. That holds true for all sections of the exam. Upon launch, only the newly released next version of the exam sections will be available for testing. So you can't take the old version that's pretty straightforward candidates already in the process will complete any final sections necessary using the next version of the exam so what that means in, in english is you have your 18 your 18 month window if you pass some sections in the 18 month window using the old version and some section and the new version same result so and that's pretty straightforward i couldn't i could not fathom them doing something doing anything other than that but good for them for putting that out there all right so thank you to nasba jumping into your questions if you have a question or comment for the podcast you can go to another 71.com click in the upper right hand corner click ask jeff and it will appear in a future edition of the podcast stephanie writes in hi jeff I recently found out I failed FAR for the second time in the 60s. My score only went up two points from the first time I took it. I've been studying FAR since September. So that's going on almost six months now. And I just feel very discouraged. Do you think I should try and take BEC or auditing and save FAR for later? I'm currently working 40 hours in summer is when my work will slow. So I'm not sure if I should focus on FAR in the summer or just keep so focus on far in the summer or just keep pushing through far and study again thank you for your help so the options are do you take far and just keep plugging away or do you take another section if i were you stephanie and if i scored in the 60s then i would be discouraged as well it m might make sense for you to switch over to BEC or auditing, whichever you're more motivated to take, and get a win under your belt, get some wind in your sails, maybe maybe adjust, so maybe you have a lot of success for, for BEC, and you notice that you weren't doing that thing for FAR, so maybe you rewrite your notes for BEC, and you do really well, so you want to implement that for FAR, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it takes a lot of motivation to to study for the CPA exam, especially when you're working full time, because it oftentimes re requires getting up early, studying over lunch, studying late at night, and it monopolizes your weekends. You lose time out with your family. Um, you uh, don't get to binge watch Netflix like you used to. <laughs> so I think there's something to be said, Stephanie, about switching to another exam. Um, I mean, for no other reason than just to put some wind back in your sails and motivate you. Jonathan says, I took FAR in January. After studying for three months, I got a 71. I knew the reason I got hit with, I, I knew the reason was I got hit with three simulations, uh, which I did not know very well. I, studied, I started studying for audit while I was waiting for my FAR score. I just took 
auditing on February 29th and got my grade a 71. I thought I killed that test. Everything seemed to go great. I don't know where to start. While I was waiting for my auditing score, I started reviewing FAR for my second retake, thinking that auditing was in the books. Now, however, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I should retake FAR or audit. In April, I don't know what to study more for audit. Well, my guess is that there's like one section in each of those, maybe two, maybe two sections for far, but there's one section where you're, where you're weak, Jonathan, and uh, I mean, where you're, where you're really weak. So you're solid and everything else. You're maybe strong in a section, but you're, but you're definitely very weak in auditing in, in one section of auditing. You need to do everything that you did to score that 71 and then really, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that you know what that is. It's like, oh, um, it's like it's like that one section that you kind of put off and you just kind of crammed for it a couple of nights before the exam and just to give yourself a, a fighting chance on exam day. Um I would also make sure that you're going that you're you're following the ninja framework. So if you go to another71.com and download the CPA exam survival guide, it's also on iTunes. Just just type in CPA exam and it'll show up under iBooks. It's it's free. It is the uh, it's the best selling free CPA exam book on iTunes. So it's a CPA exam survival guide, but it covers the ninja the ninja study framework. So you might identify something in the framework that you're not doing that can help you. And I don't really think it matters if you jump into FAR or auditing again because you're going to, have to you're going to have to cover each of them from scratch. So maybe jump back into FAR because you thought you did so well in auditing. That's a tough one, and I guess it comes down to whatever you're more motivated to study for. It, if you felt stronger in auditing, like like you really thought you did well, maybe hit. Maybe jump into auditing again, but keep in mind, like, you're not four points away. You're 75 points away. And if you went in and took the exam today without restudying everything, you're probably going to score like a 67 or 65. That's just how it goes. So be careful there. I don't, I don't know if I really helped you there, but um, other than to say, there's one section that's really haunting you. Um, restudy everything else like you did, but really hit that one section hard. Amanda says, Jeff, I found out I didn't pass FAR with a 72. This will, be, this will be my third attempt with FAR, a 74, a 70, and a 72. Unfortunately, I lost my credit for auditing, which I passed by reviewing for one week with an 81. And uh, by the way, that is very doable. So, um, <laughs> I myself am the worst procrastinator ever, and I studied. Uh, what did I study? I studied like ten days for auditing when I, when it was all said and done. But anyway, when I when I passed anyway, and um, so, but that's not recommended. <laughs> Don't let my laziness turn into a best practice recommendation. At this point, do I restudy for FAR and attempt early April or focus on auditing again? So basically, she lost her auditing credit. Taken FAR three times, 74, 70, and 72. If you're pretty down about FAR, skip it and go to auditing. If you're annoyed by far, but you're not like, you know, kind of pouting about it, which we all pout, it's okay. If you're not pouting about it, jump back into far. But recognize that you scored a 74 and then you got worse and then you did a little bit better than the second time. But your third time still wasn't as the still wasn't as good as your 74. And the reason I don't I don't know you, Amanda, but my my guess is that the reason is is because you thought you were one point away and you kind of crammed that one area that you didn't do so hot in, like not for profit accounting, but you forgot to go back over the basics and that's what kills people. So keep that in mind. I would jump back into FAR unless you're just really mad at, really mad at FAR 
and uh, then jump back in and then, then do auditing because you you obviously did well the first time. Valerie writes in, I've taken FAR twice and got a 70 and a 73. I've been using Roger CPA review and I'm considering getting your MCQ. I was wondering if there are any reviews that I can look at. Yeah, go to another71.com and in the forum, you'll see a sticky page which shows the Ninja MCQ trending versus actual exam score. So uh, Ninja MCQ tells you what you are trending towards and like, what score you're trending towards. And people post their trending score and versus what they actually scored on their on the exam, and that data is pretty interesting. There's several pages, hundreds of posts, so you can look at that. And I'd say people overwhelmingly love Ninja MCQ. It's affordable, and people are passing with it. It would make a great complement to your current course. Carrie says, Jeff, I asked in another email if the Ninja Notes layout mirrors the book, and I thought it would be a good podcast question, so I'm sending it here. I also have a note-taking question. I also believe that the key to solidify my learning is writing. However, I found with my current highlighter-heavy program, it is nearly impossible to take thorough notes while running the video as it moves along so quickly. Short of stopping and starting over and over again, do you have any recommendations? Uh, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to hit stop. So, it's um, it is it will add time to your review, but it's a difference of are you just kind of passively hearing the information and just, uh, or are you actually is the information coming in? Your brain's processing it, and then you're writing it out on paper. And then when you rewrite those notes, you see what your what your furious note scribbles were, and then you write those down into little fact nuggets. So you you refine those notes even more, and that's really the, and really all that does is it it forces you to learn the material versus just passively listen to, listening to it. And don't highlight your book. It's I mean, if you're going to spend two weeks highlighting your book, you might as well just go on a road trip and have <laughs> it'll probably have the same effect. And then come back and do your multiple choice questions. So, uh, do the Ninja Notes mirror the book? No, the Ninja Notes do not mirror the book. Um, different layout. The notes do not follow the AICPA content specification outline order. The book does and the reason why the why the notes don't is simply they came it came out three years before the book so and really they are two different products the book is your foundational learn the concepts it replaces a video course and so you do all your learning in the book then you jump to the mcq the notes are like a this wild and crazy cram and everything that's so it doesn't cover everything but everything in the notes you must know because it, most of them are, are 100 plus pages and it, if it covered everything so most of the ninja books are like four or five hundred pages or more if if the notes covered everything then they wouldn't be useful like cram notes so they're two different study tools with two different purposes but they're both both very effective for what they are intended to do douglas writes in jeff I just wanted to thank you for how helpful your materials have been so far. I'm not quite sure if people reach out to you personally, but I'm getting extremely nervous about my exam. I'm working in a real estate company as an analyst where I will be working under the partial supervision of a CPA and accounting is held in very high esteem, though not an absolute requirement like at an accounting firm. My father, mother, grandfather, and uncle are all CPAs. With this new job beginning, and my wife due to have our first kid in May, my nerves are getting wrecked. I passed BEC and auditing so far, and it took me five times to pass auditing. The most frustrating part was when I took it my fourth time, and my multiple choice score went up, and my SIM score went down. I'm not sure why I emailed you, but I know you were in a similar situation, and you had three kids when you passed. Yes, I was, and so you you passed BEC and auditing, so you have regulation and FAR left. 
And the thing of it is, is you cannot let your past failures on the CPA exam affect you. And you also can't let your past successes affect how you study either. So if you read my CPA exam survival guide, which again is free at another71.com, I tell you the mistakes to avoid when you fail and also the mistakes to avoid when you pass because I did both. Um, when you fail, so you kind of get discouraged, you kind of just start going through the motions, you, you know, when you've failed an exam five times in a row, it's hard to get out of bed at 5.30 in the morning and stumble to the pot of coffee and make some coffee and fire up the laptop and, and actually start studying versus looking at the internet for an hour while you <laughs> then go shower and go to work. It's hard to get up the motivation to do that. Similarly, if you pass, it's sometimes steal some of your motivation too because man when I passed far the first time I I kind of felt like I passed <laughs> I was so happy I felt like I had passed the whole exam so I pretty much took a year off which is a big mistake I ended up losing my far credit which uh, everyone knows how horrible far is well let me tell you um, passing it twice is even worse <laughs> so um, the key is so you have two wins under your belt so imagine yourself today like starting from scratch and only have like only having to pass two exams. Imagine your motivation if you started if you started from scratch today, and man, I'm two exams away from passing. Versus, versus okay, I've passed BEC. It took me five times to pass far. I still have two left. Like a totally different mindset than whoa. If I pass far. I pass reg, I'm done. So let that, let just, it's a total shift in mindset. So if you kind of slug through two and it takes like forever to get through those first two, and you're like, oh man, you got a long road ahead of me. Totally different mindset, totally different work ethic, totally different spirit about studying than, whoa, dude, I'm almost there. And uh, so you got to shift your mindset. It's all about, it's all about your perspective. And you have three kids. It's 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 difficult to study when you're single. It's difficult to study when you're married and no kids. It's difficult to study when you're married with kids because each because you know it's not it's not as if people who are single have like less things going on around them. They just have different things going on around them. Okay, and uh, you know I, I'm a parent of seven, so I I can. <laughs> It's like I woke up one day and I had seven kids. How'd that happen? Well, uh, <laughs> I think four of them happened uh, when I started working from home. <clears throat> so anyway, it's just everyone's busy. Everyone's just busy with different things. When you're single, you just you have different things going on. When you are married and have a bunch of kids, you just have those things going on. Everyone's busy. Everyone's got to prioritize. Kristen writes in, Jeff. Hey, I was wondering if you're looking for any more bloggers. I'm starting the CPA journey again. Moving kids, job changes have halted previous progress. I'm a senior manager at my firm with a CISA. The CPA has been my goal since I graduated high school and I just lost sight of it. Yes, we're always looking for good ninja bloggers. Uh, here is a key if you wanna be a ninja blogger. Number one, write good posts that people want to read. So. Um, number two, r edit your own posts because um, ultimately Ninja Andrea, who happens to, be me, happens to be my younger sister, so it's my way of continuing to torment her in adulthood. She's six years younger than me, so you can imagine uh, the pranks I pulled on her as we were children. Uh, if, you, if you write a, a post and uh, Andrea has to edit it because – you know we don't want we don't want to put out posts that have a lot of grammatical errors and uh, make you look bad. So we we have to edit them um, because not everyone's a great writer and that's fine. But just do the due diligence and and do your part and just you know run spell check 
and just write a good post. So all of that to say, yes, we're looking for good ninja bloggers. And if you want to be a ninja blogger, email Andrea at another71.com and put in the subject line, I want to be a ninja blogger. And um, so, and submit your, well, actually, Andrea will just get back with you. But if you want to uh, kind of cut through some of the bureaucratic process, write your first post in Microsoft Word and attach your picture. And, and, then, it, and then Andrea can take a look at it and see if you're fit. So. And she might tell you that, that we have a bunch right now and not right now. But hey, I hope that's helpful. Always looking for more Ninja bloggers. Scott says, hey Jeff, I'm trying to decide what CPA review to use and it seems like yours might be the best and most affordable. <laughs> People probably think that I just, like, that I just stuck this in there for, um, for selfish reasons and you could be right, but it happened to come in and I thought it was an excellent question. <laughs> I'm just about to graduate from college and currently broke. So I was wondering how much is it for the entire review course with everything in it? If I follow your plan, roughly how long does it take to finish and be ready for the CPA exam? I think the just candidate, like uh, just spitballing here, I think the average candidate takes, is it eight months to pass? Give or take, I mean, some people pass really quickly. Some people pass like after 14 months. So, and we all know that your exams drop off after 18 months, but I want to say eight months to a year. So let's say a year. And the the complete Ninja Combo is on the website. You can always download the free demos. Uh, the biggest thing with, with the 10 point combo is figure out if if you want to read the book yourself and study the concepts through the book, and the Ninja book is not like a normal book, but a normal book usually requires a two to three thousand dollar study course to tell you what's in the book, and that's fine. Uh, some people don't mind paying that and want an instructor to read the book to them and tell them what's in it. Other people like to just save a lot of money, spend about a third, and um, read the Ninja book themselves, jump into Ninja MCQ, pass. So you can spend $3,000 on a course, or for about a third of that, you can get the 10-point combo, and um, you know, spend the other, spend the other two-thirds on on a nice, on a really nice MacBook Pro, on a nice cruise for you and a loved one, it's all up to you. Opportunity cost, baby. So, hope that's helpful. I'm not sure if I really answered your question or not, but so the thesis of how to pick a CPU review course, like, figure out what is your learning style. So, do you like lectures? Do you like to read? And so, what is your learning style? What is your budget? So can you afford this course? Are you going to have to go into debt? Is it going to take you five years to pay off this CPU review course because you put it on MasterCard? Um, how, how expensive are, are updates? Do they do you get free updates until you pass, like with Ninja? Or do you have to you know, pay a bunch? Who knows? And, but, and also, do you like the demos? So if... If you don't like my voice in this podcast, I can all but guarantee you that you're going to hate the Ninja Audio <laughs> and Ninja Blitz. So, so if if you think I'm annoying in this podcast and some of my jokes about you think some of my jokes might be <clears throat> if you don't like my voice cracking, well, actually my my voice only cracks in the podcast. They don't it doesn't crack in the audio cuz uh, not because it didn't crack, but cuz because I redid it. So, anyway, if, if you don't like the instructor, if you don't like the mannerisms of the instructor, don't buy the course. Because I see people on the forum, they're like, I can't stand this instructor, their mannerisms, blah, blah, blah. Well, why did you buy the course? I mean, they have demos. So watch the demos, check out the samples. Does it fit your learning style? Does it fit your budget? And, uh, and if you can't decide among any of them, then get mine. <laughs> get the combo. 
Vincent says, I already have Wiley CPA Excel, but should I supplement my studying with only Ninja MCQs because I already bought Wiley? I took BEC and failed once, and I don't want to buy the comprehensive Ninja products because that would be overkill. Maybe it would be overkill if you if you're going to study with all of your other review course materials, add Ninja and then pass, then that's fine. If you are not because if you're not going to go through your old study materials again, and if you're not going to cover them at a foundational level and you're just gonna hit Ninja MCQ, you really need that foundational level. So either watch the videos again, take notes again, or get the Ninja book and Ninja MCQ at a minimum. So I hope that's helpful. And Ninja MCQ, you can use it with any course. The second half of this podcast is sounding a lot like a marketing message, but um, don't, don't intend for it to be. These are actually just questions that came in. Craig says, my access to Glime materials has expired with the exception of FAR. I've only passed BEC. I prepared for regulation using using only your Ninja MCQ by reading the answer explanations and creating my own flashcards. For my retakes with reg, unless a miracle happens, and audit, what materials from your site do you recommend that will give me the most bang for my buck and be the co- most cost effective? If you already have a base course to use, then get Ninja MCQ and Ninja Notes. If you don't have a base course to use, then get uh, Ninja MCQ and Ninja Book. And if you want to get it all, then you have the combo. So I hope that is helpful. All right, let's jump in to some CPA exam terminology. And these are four terms that you should know on exam day. Up first, for FAR, is accounts receivable turnover. AR turnover is a measure of the collectability of accounts receivable. So how is the company collecting their accounts receivable? It's one thing to sell a product and get revenue. It's another thing to actually collect the money. A low turnover rate is desirable because it indicates more collectability than a high rate. So when you have a turnover ratio, what is being turned over is in the denominator. So for accounts receivable turnover, you have annual credit sales divided by average accounts receivable for the year. So to simplify it, credit sales over average AR. The BEC term for today is hash totals. And hash totals are an input control. It's an IT term. So hash totals are an input control. They are a nonsense total. For example, the sum of digits of an invoice number. A hash total is similar to a control total and is used to verify processing or output compared to input. So you you compare what was inputted to what was outputted and they should be the same. That was hash total. For auditing, we have positive confirmations. A positive confirmation is one in which the debtor, so the auditor sends the debtor a request to respond whether or not they are in agreement with the information that is given. So do you owe this much? And they are, they are required to respond or they are requested to respond. The, the positive form is used when individual account balances are relatively large or where there is reason to believe there may be a substantial number of of accounts in dispute or that they contain inaccuracies or fraud. So that's really the takeaway there. The auditor thinks that there might be something going on and the balances are large, so they send a positive confirmation to the other party and ask them to request or ask them to respond whether or not they are in agreement. Now contrast that with a negative confirmation which is when they say, hey, this is what we have for you. Only respond if you don't agree. And the auditor would use these on smaller amounts and when the the control risk is low and so on. The regulation term of the day, qualifying small business corporation, which is a corporation uh, using section 1244 stock 
And to qualify as a domestic small business corporation means that the corporation and its aggregate capital must not exceed $1 million at the time it's issued to the shareholders. And the corporation must satisfy a gross receipts test as an active business. This test requires the corporation during the period of its five most recent years, ending before the date the loss on its stock was sustained, derive more than 50% of its gross receipts from sources other than passive income. So that's the big deal with Section 1244 must derive more than 50% of its gross receipts from sources other than passive investment income. So why do we care about Section 1244 stock? Why is it a big deal? It's a big deal because the losses for 1244 are ordinary to a certain amount and not capital. That's the benefit. It can offset your ordinary income, not just your capital gains. All right. So those were the terms of the day. That's a new little new little twist I added to the podcast. And if you're like, man, those are some excellent CPA exam terms, Jeff, where can I get more? Well, Ninja MCQ has hundreds of them loaded in there as part of the package. So you have your MCQ, your simulations, and hundreds of CPA exam relevant terms. So if you want more terms, you can get them from Ninja MCQ. All right, well that does it for this edition of CPA Reviewed. Again, if you want to be on the podcast, go to another71.com and click Ask Jeff. You can also hit me up on Facebook and I am always in the forum, the CPA exam forum, the most visited CPA exam forum in all of CPA exam land. (laughs) So anyway, thank you everyone. Thank you for listening. Be good, take care, and I will talk to you soon.